This is Jonathan Lane from Fan Film Factor, and these two gentlemen above me are Mr. John Broughton, who is the showrunner and star of both Starship Farragut and also the very soon to premiere Farragut Forward. And hopefully you folks have already had a chance to watch the amazing prologue, the three minute teaser that they just released. This movie era. We don't get a lot of movie era fan films out there. And not only that, it looks amazing in terms of movie era. And uh, then we have uh, this fellow over here, and that is Johnny K. And Johnny K is too cool for a last name. He only has a last initial. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, he actually does have a last name, but it's kind of like Bruno. We don't talk about Bruno. We don't talk about Johnny K's last name. Anyway, uh, now, Johnny, you're going to be, you're directing, right? That's right. And what else are you doing with Farragut for? What, what are the other places that your name is going to appear on the credits? Uh, probably a few different places. John and I haven't hashed everything out, but uh, the way the prologue went, uh, director, cinematographer, editor, and I've recently learned that I will not be the visual effects artist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we'll, we'll get there in, uh, in just a moment. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff today. But the first thing I would like to um, discuss is actually who, who you guys are. I mean, I've already covered Starship Farragut. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it was a very long-running fan series. Um, started out in uh, the 2000 aughts, I think, like somewhere around 2007, right? No, it started right. in 2005. Five, yeah, that's right, 2005, even earlier than that. They have released a whole bunch, like ten or twelve different fan films of different lengths, including two animated fan films, which is amazing. Elsewhere on the blog site, you can read the history of Starship Farragut. In fact, that was one of the first full multi-part histories I ever did as a blog was researching the history of Farragut mm. and most recently your homecoming your very last Starship Farragut for that wrapping up that series uh, just premiered and that was excellent had Stan Lee uh, in the cameo by the way Godspeed Starship Farragut McCann out so you guys know John as Jack Carter the captain of the USS Farragut but I would like for just a few moments for them to uh, meet John Broughton, the person. Tell them a little bit about who you are, your, your job, your family life, where you live. Let's, let's meet you. All right. Well, um, I would say outside of fan films, I am um, director of business development for a federal government contracting firm. Um, I've been doing business development proposals, government contracting since I got out of the Navy in 95 and I've also been a project manager on several film video projects for the federal government. Um, one, one for the US Army, that was a training video um, and three other video contracts for the Veteran Affairs. And I got into that actually because of Starship Farragut. Um, one of the principals of the company shared some of the video work around and we went after a contract and I guess it was 2017 and we won it for the, the first one was for the um, veteran affairs. It was a public service announcement and we've just done more and more of that. So, so that's, that's, that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> and you're happily married. I know I've seen pictures of your wife on Facebook. She's a very attractive woman. Um, you have a that's wonderful it. son, uh, Xavier. Is that right? Xavier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's actually worked in one of Johnny's other films. That's right. That's right. He's, he's now had his acting career started. <laughs> is, is Xavier looking to be an actor? Is he taking like any kind of acting? Um, he's got a lot of talent, I think. And he, he's just a natural at it, much more than, than I ever was. Um, so I hope so. He's got a lot of personal charm and charisma. And, and he just isn't just naturally entertains people. I mean, he's, he's the one in the family that makes all of us laugh. So. <laughs> yeah, I got one of those too. Um, I think, I think uh, Xavier and, and my son Jaden are close to the same age. How, how old is Xavier? Um, 11. 11, yeah, Jaden's 11. So we will have an 11 year old, cool. Uh, all right, let's move on to Johnny Too Cool for a last name, Kay. <laughs> uh, 
And uh, so, um, let's let's ask a little, let's find out a little bit about you, uh, family life, job life, and how you got involved in all this filmmaking stuff. I got to say first, like John's kid Xavier, who is an incredibly talented kid, and he is funny. He's a ham hilarious and i cast him in the most dramatic somber role possible so the only time we could get jokes out of xavier was like in between takes and then when the camera was rolling he had to be this like you know much more sad and kind of beaten down kid so i should probably you know it should be criminal for me to have done that to that kid but he did he did a great (laughs) job by the way and what's the name of that is is that film out yet or is that going to be coming out soon or the trailer's out the name of the film is red eagle one it is a short one Yep. And it's about a little boy who wants to go to Mars, despite a world telling him that he can't. So he's got the world stacked against him. And uh, yeah, I can we can talk about that a little later. But Red Eagle One, uh, the trailer's out there. You'll definitely see Xavier uh, in the trailer. Uh, the movie itself is in post. I wanted to get it out last year. A few other projects uh, kind of jumped the queue uh, ahead of Red Eagle One. I got to go back and, and add some special sauce that I, I want to get in there to, to get it out before I release it. Uh, one of the beauties of uh, kind of working on films, you know, yourself, you know, there's not a lot of folks banging down the door asking, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Not even John is doing that. And his son is in it. Uh, so I can kind of, you know, work on it and, and be a perfectionist and get it out when I'm ready to get it out. But uh, Red Eagle One is hopefully coming out this year. Um, yeah. And moving right into me. Uh, yep. I live a few miles south of John, uh, Washington, D.C. area. Uh, also, I'm a career government contractor uh, working for different levels of government. Uh, spent a good portion of my career uh, overseas and have bounced back and forth uh, between the DC area uh, and, f- you know, fun locales worldwide. Uh, been planted here pretty much in Northern Virginia for the last, uh, let's see, moved here almost 20 years ago. Like I said, a lot of time kind of spent overseas between then and now. Um, unmarried, live with my girlfriend, beautiful girlfriend. Uh, no kids, um, dedicate my life basically to, you know, kind of making the most of every day. I learned at a, a young age that, you know, life is pretty short. And if you're not having an absolute blast every day of your life, the only person who can fix that is you. And those are the words I've kind of always lived by. And, you know, for the most part, I have a blast pretty much every day of my life. And that's kind of what got me into film, um, made my first film and, um, did not drive myself insane. And I still have as many friends after the film as I had before we made the film. And, <laughs> and uh, it's kind of an addiction, you know, after I made it, I thought now I just want to do that over and over again. So here we are. Now, when was that? When did you make your first film? 2019. 2019. Oh, so it was pretty recently. And, Very and, recent. your, and, and your production studio is Chaotica with a K because you're Johnny K too cool for a last name. Uh, Chaotica <laughs> Studios. <laughs> That's right. Yep. And um, and you created some pretty impressive uh, films right now. You you had a, a horror film that, that won like a ton of awards. And that was pretty early in your filmmaking career, right? That was number one. That was the that very was the first, first one. one. It was, uh, yeah, John, John's probably heard this ad nauseum, but uh, <laughs> the short version of it, yeah, it, just a personal challenge to myself. I'd worked uh, on screen uh, doing a lot of shows here in uh, Virginia that were filming at the time. Uh, Good Lord Bird with Ethan Hawke. I worked on that show for a while, I worked on the Walking Dead spinoff that they filmed down in Richmond, and then a couple others here and there, and just kind of being on those professional sets every day, it really inspired me. I just went into learning mode and, you know, didn't I got away from the craft services table and actually kind of kept my eyes and ears open to see, you know, what decisions creative people were making around me and just kind of watched, you know, Hollywood A-game, uh, and it inspired me. And I walked off those sets thinking, you know, I don't want to go out and invest a ton of money in equipment. I've already got some because I was a, a photographer in a past life. And, you know, I had closets full of cameras and lights and things. I just kept making excuses, you know, you know, to, to you know, to make my first film. There was always an excuse I would come up with. And one day I kind of had enough of it and said, you know what, I'm going to do it. I'm going to give myself 60 days. And at the end of that 60 days, I'll either have a movie or I won't. And if the movie sucks, I'll never have to show it to anybody. It's, it'll be like it never happened. And at the end of that 60 days, it was The Killer of Grassy Ridge, which was my very first film. Uh, I was happy, uh, very proud of it. And on a whim, I decided to shoot it into a couple festivals just because it seemed like a fun thing to do. And what I did not expect is it got picked up in the festival circuit in the middle of the pandemic, by the way. Uh, Most of our festivals were early 2020 and then right into the summer of 2020. 
and it got picked up. It got selected for more than 50 around the world. We hit every continent except Antarctica. And I'm still looking for the, the Antarctica Film Festival just so I can <laughs> round out the, all the continents. And we, uh, we picked up some pretty major awards that I never thought a debut short film could win. We got Best U.S. Short Film, uh, Best Horror, Best Thriller, a few others for Best Debut. And you want to talk about an addiction. I mean, as soon as we got hit with that and we made the first film, I'm like, why, why am I not doing this once or twice a year? You know, it's, it's fun. It's, it's stressful, but it's a good kind of stress and it's expensive, but it's a good kind of expensive. So why, why don't we just do this more often? So now here we are. And now here we are. So that leads to my next question. Cause I, obviously you are in the process of making a number of films. In fact, you're making, well, we can talk about this later. If we have time, we're making a Batman fan film, which looks amazing. Now you're making a Star Trek fan film so the the question is how did you two get together mr farragut and mr too cool for a last name that's getting old uh how did you guys first meet and how did you guys decide okay we're gonna we're gonna make farragut for it happen do you want me to tell a story john go for it okay in 2013 um, farragut films was exhibiting at the Shore Leave Convention um, outside Baltimore, Maryland. And Johnny stopped by our table. I noticed he had with him a, um, a com badge, um, QMX, about three or four months before. I think earlier in, earlier that year, they had introduced the um, com badge uh, pin. And he had one, and it, it, was, it looked like a screen-use prop. And I talked to him about it, and he indicated it was the QMX you know, pen, magnetic pen, and and all he did was spray some Model Master matte clear on it, and I was just like, oh wow! And and we were talking about props, and then we um, after the event we stayed in touch. He's also um, a gifted uh, photographer, and so he helped me quite a bit on how to edit images, and we stayed in touch. And then, you know, um, he. As he mentioned about the killer Grassy Ridge, I saw that premiere event and the second film, my son was involved. And then last summer, um, summer of 2021, I, I started thinking about, you know, when we, we were in full swing in 2016, um, we were already in full product, pre-production for Farragut Forward. And the fan film guidelines came out. And so I, I punted, I, I shelved everything. I gave away everything that was Star Trek or sold it or even threw away Star Trek stuff. And um, I was kind of down with Star Trek and fan film. So, so five years forward, I, I started thinking about, um, and maybe the scene of John's work, uh, more recent creative work on films. And I just started thinking about the monster maroons and, having wished I did Farragut forward. And I thought, you know what, what if we just did a, a three minute little teaser film, a what if film? It was never the intent to make something larger. And it was after Johnny had shared some, pub, um, some test shots and it kind of broke the internet and we just, here we are. Um, but that's how <laughs> we met and that's how we got rolling, rolling on Farragut forward. So you just, at some point last summer, you just sort of had this epiphany of, I want to get back into making Star Trek fan films again because you know you no 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 was, I wanted I <laughs> I no I um no I the 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 idea was to just make a teaser well, no, just a three that's minute teaser awesome. but that's, wanted, that's gonna, still that's still pulling you back in though. it is it is pulling it back but it was I wanted to put it out there as a big surprise we weren't even um gonna show anything no no pictures or anything and just see what the reaction would be from people. I had, and, oh man, uh, that would have so broken the internet. Yeah. <laughs> so we, um, yeah, but it, the reaction was so strong. And then seeing the reaction, because I didn't think honestly anyone would care. And so then it, the wheel started turning and we started working on making a full, you know, making the, the full film. I was just going to add on. I don't think I've ever even told John this. Um, you know, I had, I continue to have a full plate and that's not a complaint. And I certainly had a full plate. Last year, we were looking at Ready to Go One and then um, The Oath, which is the Batman fan film, and then two additional projects after that. So, you know, absolutely, I was kind of maxed out. And then here comes John in the door with this 
the script. <laughs> and I've never told you on this. I think, John, if you had written, if you and Paul had written an entire 30 minute episode, I would have had to say no. But mm-hmm. the fact that it was just a three minute piece, because I knew that's a weekend shoot, we could shoot it in a weekend. We can edit it, you know, a few weeks after that and do some post. And I can sneak that into the schedule because it's such a a tiny commitment, a small right. piece of work, if you will. I think if you'd come in the door with a full episode script, I probably would have said no. And we might not have been doing this interview right now, but because it was the script of the three minute right. prologue, which by the way, was probably a two page script. There's not a lot of. It was, it was only, yeah. it was really, I, I kept the idea, I think to you and Paul and Mike at the same time say, Hey, what do you guys think? And, and um, then, Paul and I, I think we refined the story. And then you, you, you overlaid your refinements on top of that. But um, yeah, it was never, the idea was, it was just, I just wanted to see what the reaction from people would be. It was never to do, um, certainly never to do another web series again. It, w- it was more of a one-off and see what reaction would be. Well, if you didn't know what that reaction was going to be, I knew what that reaction was going to be. Because, <laughs> You know, here's the thing about Starship Farragut. You were you were one of what I would call the big three, uh, and or possibly I'd say big four, because you know you you like New Voyages and Starship Continues after you and Exeter were the ones filming on an actual TOS bridge. You know, and you you were the one that looked like you could be that missing season of Star Trek, and so. You know, so you you developed that following just because of that. But you know, it wasn't just that. I mean, you had you had some pretty decent episodes. Your stuff was fun to watch, and you know, obviously, you were having a ball with it. And you know, years later, I mean, when I first started Fan Film Factor, I was looking for fan series to cover, and you know, unfortunately, at that point, you were just kind of wrapping up. <laughs> but uh, you know, I covered your last crowdfunder for you know what would be homecoming and. You know, I wanted to do a, a history of it. And your history was just so fascinating because you had, you had been doing it for such, you know, a decade at that point. And I think the fans knew that you had quality, that you were dedicated, that you knew how to complete what you started. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you add to that a Monster Maroon, I mean, even if it was just you in front of a, a black you know, curtain in a monster maroon, you know, the old, the old joke, you know, I'd, I'd listen to him, you know, read the phone book. It's like, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd pay to just watch John, you know, standing there wearing his monster rune. At least it looks so gorgeous on you. Um, you know, I, I wore this in your honor, by the way, uh, today. Thank you. Uh, was... But uh, <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I think that when you add even more to that, when you add, you know, Johnny's eye for cinematography and you are, a really awesome director, I have to say. I mean, mm-hmm. the Killer of Grassy Ridge was gorgeous in the very Blair Witch kind of way. And, you know, it's 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 not easy to get some of those shots that you have there. I mean, people, you know, watch it and they just kind of sit back, oh, it looks good. He's a like, or whatever, you know. I, I looked at that through a photographer's eye and said, you know, my God, he must have been on the ground. And I saw pictures and yes, he was actually on the ground. <laughs> I am not surprised that you broke the internet when this thing came out. And in addition to that, I have, and I'm going to going to talk about this in, in our next segment here. It wasn't just that we got to see John in a monster maroon, and it wasn't just that it was done well. I was as soon as I found out about this, I kept asking John the same question. I wanted to get as much information on fan film factor as I could, and that question is, who else from from Starship Farragut is coming back? Oh. And you would not tell me. And I kept saying, I said, we're going to see Michael Bednar, you know, we're going to see Holly, uh, Michael's wife, you know, are we going to see, you know, Paul? Because, you know, the, the, the very end of, of, of Homecoming, uh, you know, Paul Sieber's character, even though he's died, his mirror universe counterpart is still alive. And I think, are you going to be, you know, picking up on that? And I interviewed you for Homecoming and you wouldn't tell me a freaking thing. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and oh yeah i mean i i tried i tried johnny and um he threw me in an agonizer booth i i, <laughs> I, I, I broke free you should have painted 
Yeah. <laughs> well, he's, he's always taking pain, pain sticks. So he could, you know, agonize your boots. <laughs> Choose your poison. Um, some people are into that. Uh, anyway, so when I saw Michael there, first of all, you know, I knew that John was in it. When I first saw that close up on Michael's face, I was like, is that John? Because John has more of a beard, you know? It's like, that's not, that's kind of like a little few days of growth. You know, what happened, you know? And, and, you know, pulls back and like, holy crap, that's Mike. That is, that is RT. That is Robert Taggart, the first officer of the Farragut and eventually a captain in his own right. And like, okay, he's going to be in it. And then the Klingon, you know, says something about Smithfield and like, well, that's Holly Bednar's character. And like, okay, all of our friends are coming back. They might not necessarily look too good because <laughs> they've been beaten up by Klingons. Um, I was like, okay. So I finished watching this thing and I'm like, this is exciting. I want to see more, which is a perfect transition uh, and a segue into your crowdfunding. You are, and I, you know, and, and we're recording this uh, about a week before it'll actually air on Fan Film Factor, but they had just launched the crowdfunder with a $30,000 goal, which I had, I just, I told them before this we started, I said, I said, that's pretty darn ambitious because I think that since the guidelines were announced, we haven't had a crowdfunder that's gone over 25,000. So they're going to try for 30. And um, I think you guys were already at like 500 or 700 just after a few hours. So, you know, you're on your way. But uh, I think fans are going to be very excited about this. I think you're going to get, you know, certainly a bunch of money. And the good news is then you go, go, even if you don't reach your goal, you still get what you collect. But let's talk a little bit about what you're planning to do. Obviously, you're going to finish up this episode. It's not just three minutes anymore. You're going to finish this thing up. Yes. Uh, what is this money? What is this $30,000 going to be put towards? Primarily all the set construction. I mean, we're having to build new sets, the movie era sets. So we don't have these sets like our old, T old TOS sets to leverage. We have to build new sets from scratch. And these are sets no one else has. So it's not, it's not even like there's a group out there that we can travel to and film on their set. So it all has to be built new. So most of that is on that, as well as the wardrobe. The wardrobe, if you hadn't noticed, is much more complex. It's not a, it's not a one shirt or a skirt. It is an elaborate costume. I mean, we are like we did with TOS where we, made all the uniforms from the exacting fabric and color and all the attention to detail that we made for the sets. I mean, we're doing the same thing with this and those monster maroon uniforms in particular are very expensive. Um, are you, are you buying them from a, a costumer like a Novos or are you like sewing them yourself? Or no, we're, we're sewing them. Um, yeah. We're making them um, ourselves. Kind they look of, amazing. I mean, they're 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 so they're so gorgeous. I mean, I, you know, obviously, it's not like there's never been a, a movie era fan film before. You know, they are out there, but unfortunately, you know, we don't have access to really good monster maroons. That's the most probably the most difficult. Right. You know, I mean, I mean, when they were made on a commercial scale and mass produce, I mean, they were going for about what eighteen hundred a jacket. And um, that was having them all made in China, uh, mass produced. Um, so we're having to faithfully recreate all these from scratch and they'll all be tailored to the respective actor. Um, and we're working to make about a, a two dozen of them, which I wow. think believe was more than what the initial production was for Star Trek II. All the, um, the notions, the chain, the purse claps, I mean, the belt, the everything is, is it's it's a lot more elaborate and the expenses so a lot of that you have the wardrobe and then you have the sets and then the regular um, production costs when you are filming you have craft services you have if you're doing overnight stay somewhere um, our, our studio is located in Frederick Maryland so it's about it's not it's, it's just outside the Washington DC area so there's some travel associated with that and and then there's if, um, our post-production cost. So the nice ship shots and special effects. 
That's true. And I was going to ask, um, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to the sets in just a second. I want to ask about the visual effects because I know that your Klingon ship that the bird of prey that appears at the end of your, your prologue is a model that was not CGI. That was actually a physical glued together painted model. And I know that Johnny Kay was looking to do practical effects for even the, the Farragut itself, which is going to return as a, as a Reliant class, Miranda class, Avenger class, whatever you want to call that. So is that still the plan? Because you hinted earlier on in this interview that, that you're no longer going to be visual effects coordinator. <laughs> <laughs> well, I learned, I don't know that I was ever coordinator, but what I can tell you is in that three minute prologue, the four second shot of the bird of prey was by far the hardest shot of that film by far. Um, and I was being a little too perfect with it probably, but yeah, I wanted to get the shadows just right. I wanted to get the angles right. And then all that's just shooting it, you know, before you get it into post and, um, and then once it got into post, I had to learn a lot because I'm, I'm not a visual effects guy. I know enough to be dangerous. And uh, I got in there and played with it. And after I, you know, spent probably weeks on that, John, you know, he saw the file names of each of my uh, <laughs> test files. They got, they got progressively more and more profane as uh, the more of them there were. So some, some of my file names had uh, profanity in the file name itself, but um, <laughs> especially the latter ones. But uh, yeah, when we Farragut got to Farragut Ford that, becomes Stefan Farragut Ford. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was uh, the, the BOP had something else in front of it for a while, I think. But, but I told John, I said, I said, I said, you know what, realistically, I said, I think there's got to be a hybrid. I said, I think it'd be, uh, you know, I would love to say we shot at 100% with practical models because I'm a practical effects guy. But reality is it's going to have to be a hybrid because, you know, unless, I don't know, we'll see how the crowdfunding does and maybe we can, you know, go find some former ILM guys or something to, <laughs> to do it all practical. But my, my hunch is moving forward, it's going to end up being a hybrid of both. Yeah, and there, there was another uh, uh, fan film called uh, Star Trek First Frontier. And that was Kenny Smith, who had um, had uh, uh, two fellows uh, who actually worked on um, Hidden Figures. They actually did the, uh, they, they built the capsule uh, that was used in Hidden Figures. And they built a Pike era, actually pre-Pike era, it's April era. Enterprise was like 10 or 11 feet long. It was like $31,000 to build it because they wanted to do practical effects. And they had green screen, they had all this stuff. And it, the model looks so gorgeous, but unfortunately when all was said and done, it wasn't lit in the proper way. There were there were problems with the visual effects and they couldn't go back and you know reshoot the thing again because it was just they had a whole you know, mm -hmm. studio that had been taken. And ultimately they ended up going with, you know, a CGI artist, Sam Cockings, to help finish that one up. And I felt so bad because it's such a gorgeous model and it took, you know, like a year to build. And it was, you know, but you know, the world has come a long way since the practical models that we had on, on TOS and, and the movies. So but but even um, even John, if I could interject the what you see now with even unless it's a Marvel film, I always feel like to me, the, the um, as it relates to CGI and models that they create by computer, it just it there's something about it. It just lacks depth of field and detail. I mean, just the shadows and and when you see on our our film at the end where that that ship just backs out, mm -hmm. I mean, oh, it's all gorgeous. that depth of field and that sh it just looks there's nothing in my opinion that it, it comes better than seeing real models. Um, so I, yeah, it'll, it'll likely be a hybrid, but where we can get those beautiful shots of real models. I mean, and and like John and Johnny and myself, the guy who made it, Michael Bednar, um, he's a model master and- so Michael right builds there, things. <laughs> yes, and he does it very well. And, by, by, uh, by the way, for those who don't know, Michael was the one who built most of the TOS sets that are now in Kingsland, Georgia, uh, were used for Starship Farragut, for Star Trek Continues. Mike was the supervisor. I mean, he didn't construct everything all by himself. In fact, I believe your dad helped him and a whole bunch of other people did. But that is Mike Bednar, he who makes things. Uh, and, <laughs> you know, uh, and he also makes this beautiful claim. Now, is he making your Miranda the class, Reliant. Avenger class, yes. Reliant class, whatever? Um, so, and a, a, a quick question. So the Farragut, from Starship Farragut was a heavy cruiser like the Enterprise and the Enterprise got refit into, you know, the gorgeous refit, my favorite Starship ever. 
Uh, but you decided to decommission and not refit and to create an entirely new Farragut in a different class. So what, what was the, the genesis, if I may, of that idea? Oh, um, I think that was Paul Sieber's idea. He wrote the script for Homecoming. And when we started, we weren't ever supposed to do Homecoming. Um, when we sold the sets, I had it in the, the contract that within one year of the sale of the sets, we would be able to come back gratis and use the sets for one week and film something. And the intent was to do a documentary. We had been doing it for, um, you know, up around 10 years at that point. And I thought it'd be nice to document everything that Farragut Films has, had done. I mean, people had met through our project and got married. They got married and engaged on the sets. We had people that, um, a lot of great stories and how the sets came about. We had a smaller, the first film studio in, in, was in St. Mary's. And then we got the bigger, um, building with all the other sets and so there was this evolution of things that happened a lot of great stories and I, I just wanted to document it and do a one-hour documentary and talk to all the people that built the sets and so that was the intent and Paul wrote this finale and he knew I was already in pre-production mode of Farragut Forward wanting to do the movie air it was something that um so so, so when Paul um he said, I'm going to write the script and you can either use it or not. And he wrote it and that was in the script. And, and we both talked about having it as a segue to close out TOS and then, you know, start the new chapter of, of Farragut. And then you just decided that you're going to have a different Farragut ship. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. So he had it in there. Yeah. And that was Paul's idea that, that it would not be we, both of us had always we collaborated quite a bit. And um we were always in agreement that we didn't want to do all the things that the enterprise did or, or the crew of the enterprise did. We, we didn't want to, you know, it wasn't going to be a cliche of everything they had done. We wanted it to be different and unique and um, interesting. So having a new ship and it's like, well, if we had a new ship, which one would we do? I always liked the, the, the Reliant. It seemed like a little, um, a nice little gunship, the engine that could, it, it, I know, I think it was smaller than the enterprise. But it seemed bit. to be, yeah, a little bit. And it was, um, it had a lot more guns, I think, than the Enterprise. So it was a little, I, I like that that notion and um, big fan of Star Trek too. So um, it seemed to all work. So so damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. You just yes. wanted to make sure you had enough torpedoes to make sure you could damn them. Uh, so, um, so let's talk a little bit about these amazing sets that Michael is going to be building. Uh, with some help, I'm sure. Uh, Mike's, what, Mike's not building them this time. Oh, no, he's no. not? Okay, who's, who's building no, the sets this time? Holly would probably be <laughs> <laughs> out in the yard. Um, Holly he, would be painstaking him. Yes, yes. Yeah. Would. It's like, if you're um, going to build sets, you might as well build a nice deck for her. You know. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. Um, and that took a lot out of him, too. I mean, he did that enough. He's, he's like me, burnt out with fan films. I'm certain he was burnt out with building sets. Um, so his, I think his, where he will gravitate towards, will be building, making models for us to oh, okay. use it for filming. Um, we have a new guy, Craig Hauer, who was involved in our production. He played the Andorian communications officer in our finale homecoming. That was a nod. I thought it would be nice to, since Xer was kind of like what started me, I wanted to close out and make a nice salute to Starship Exeter. So their character, Bafuzalik, who was the Andorian communications officer, we just thought it'd be a nice nod to have um, a scene where we had the Andorian communications officer sitting. And um, so that was our nod to them. Cool. So Craig played that character and, and he is our director of set construction. He's got a lot of experience doing set construction for theater play productions. Uh, now, I know you're building the bridge because uh, I've seen a portion of it. What other sets are you building? The bridge, the transporter room. Um, we have a, I believe you called it an all purpose room, John, John, mm -hmm. um, which we will leverage for sick bay and uh, crew quarters. And depending on the funding, we 
we'd like to build out a court or two. So the transporter room and the um, bridge set are, are needed. They're, they'll be the key sets that we'll have. Okay, fair enough. Um, and Oh, I'm sorry. And then outside yeah. of that, for the Klingon, we'll have a, a – we've already seen the Klingon brig. We'll have another Klingon ship set and then the bridge of the Klingon ship. Well, that's a lot to build, my goodness. And I've already actually seen the the wider shots. So I'll put them up here of your, your Klingon bridge set – or your Klingon uh, brig set, I should say. And it's amazing how small that was for real. <laughs> he is the master of um, illusion. You know, a good camera person, a good cinematographer can make even the smallest set look, look big. So once again, my hat, which I'm not wearing, I'm the only person not wearing a hat today, uh, is off to you. Uh, that's why I'm not wearing a hat, because it's off to you guys. And um, so so that is, that's a lot of sets to, to have to create. Now, are you guys going to do any green screen as well, or is it just... Um, I hope not. I hope not. That was, <laughs> not, that was, um, not if I have my way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, it's not, I should clarify that. I guess it's not my, I'm just kind of an old school guy. I'm a pre, I, I don't know. I, there's so much awesome stuff you can do with green screen, but I also think you can sometimes overuse green screen and we do, you know, have the, the talent and the staff and hopefully if the crowdfunding campaign goes as well as we think it will, the finances, um, you know, we have all those tools in our toolbox to actually build these things physically. And I mean, just my preference, I would love to shoot a hundred percent of this on real sets. And then maybe if we need to go back and get a green screen for pickups or something in case of an emergency, sure. Uh, but plan a, I think for me is, is, you know, physical sets, plan B is, is green screen just just my take on it john knows my opinion on it so oh i'm in full concurrence i mean i it, it one of the one of the things that held up um homecoming we had a few green screen shots and yeah it just it unless you do it right and it just it, it compounds the or it can create um more challenges and than needed yeah and it can also create you know some obvious inconsistencies if you know you, you can tell that the screen screen that you know you, you switch between so are these sets going to be permanent standing sets are you building you said you you have a studio is this like a studio that you you either own or pay rent on uh where they can stand and, and be there for a long time or are they going to be created and then taken down the sets are being built so they'll be modular in a sense that when we're done if we need to store them um we can we can stack them up and they'll, they'll be such that we can handle them and transport them for a storage facility. But right now they're staying up um, currently and the plan is to have them standing up um, permanent sets. Would you be willing to let them be used by other fan productions that wanted to? Um, I don't know. I hadn't, that's the first time that that thought has occurred to me. Um, I, not that I'm asking, but you know, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, um, right now I think we're, we're just focused on building the sets. <laughs> um, so that's kind of long-term. I mean, people have been asking me about doing Farragut Fest. We were the first to be able to have a public, um, general open or public, publicly general house, open house event where people could come and take tours of the sets. We were the first to do that. And, um, I, I I wasn't, I'm less interested in having a clubhouse as I am building film sets to be able to make movies. So I think that's all down the road kind of thing. Okay, fair enough. So I just figured I'd ask. I know that, you know, some, some people make their, their sets available to other people like, you know, the um, Len Wolf and Dan Reynolds down in Warp 66 Studios in Arkansas. Obviously the Kingsland sets are still being used. James Cauley sets not anymore uh, because they're the, the, the set tour. Um, I know that Alec Peters, once he puts his bridge back together again, is making that, you know, offering that to other fan films to use. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that we, we will, but it, to me, I'm, I'm just trying to build the sets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <We're just trying laughs> One thing at a time, Jonathan, for yes. God's sakes, let's get them funded and let's get them built. John still um, hasn't, uh, John still hasn't recovered from the price of lumber. He's still reeling from <laughs> lumber costs. So. Yeah, that's true, especially with the uh, inflation and the uh, and the supply chain. Uh, 
we're discovering because uh, we're we're actually about to remodel the house, and um, there was, you know, it, we were supposed to remodel our, our house. I know nobody cares about this. It's a Star Trek, but uh, no, we, we were supposed to remodel our house a year ago, and you know what we ran into in the supply chain? Nail shortage. Wow. Apparently, nails are made in China, and they were parked. Uh, I could have swum out to Long Beach, you know, and gotten them, um, but I can't you know, swim miles and miles carrying nails. Um, but yeah, they're just, you know, on one of those many, many, many ships out there. And like, literally, you know, we had wood, we just didn't have nails. Uh, so hopefully that, that, that'll be coming before you guys, you know, have to start building yours. <laughs> um, okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the production of Prologue, um, not just the pre-production, but the production. So, so did you film that all in like, a single day or was that over a weekend or it was it was scheduled to be a weekend when we first started talking uh we had planned it as a two-day shoot and the primary reason behind that is because we knew the set was going to have to be torn down halfway through and then reconstructed for the turnarounds so when you watch the prologue everything facing toward tackett that direction all of that was shot in the morning and then everything facing the opposite direction toward you know who uh, all of that was shot in the evening, all the over the shoulders, et cetera. So it was originally scheduled to be a two day shoot. And, you know, as you know, you know, clean on prosthetics and makeup. I mean, it takes these guys hours to get into costume. And I think we had a call time of, <clears throat> we shot this back in October. So it's been a minute now. I think our call time might've been 8 AM or something like that with ambitions to have the camera rolling by 10. Um, those ambitions weren't met. I don't think, but uh <laughs> Yeah, halfway through the day. I mean, the day was going very well. Uh, and halfway through the day, I kind of posed the question. I said, all right, you know, there's a chance we can shoot this entire thing today and finish it. You know, we'll have to see how the set teardown goes. And I kind of posed that to the to the cast, especially the Klingons who were preparing to come back the next morning and do all the prosthetics all over again because they weren't going to sleep in it. And uh, everybody kind of across the board said, let's push. Let's push and do it. And we pushed and everybody kind of, you know, chipped in. We broke for lunch uh, in the, in the evening, I guess. And uh, the set came down and then the set went right back up in the other direction and reconfigured and the lights were re-rigged and we rolled again. And yeah, what was originally scheduled to be a two day shoot, I think we crammed into about 12 hours. And at the end of that, everybody was wiped. Uh, John, I mean, I'll let him talk about his knees. We had him kneeling the whole time and we did have foam. Oh, uh, we did have foam underneath him, but, you know, suffice it to say, none of us are as, as young as we used to be. And toward the end of that, John, I don't know if John was doing a lot of acting toward the end of that. I think some of the, the screams of pain were, were 100% <laughs> real. But We had some foam down, but underneath that foam was, was concrete, as John can attest. And, uh, yeah, at the end of the day, we actually just kind of expected everybody to be done and worn out. And what ended up happening is no one left. Everybody got undressed, but now it's 10, 30, 11 o'clock. Let me clarify. Not everybody got undressed. The actors <laughs> got out of their costumes. Uh, and next thing you know, it's 10 or 11 o'clock on a Saturday night, and we rolled right into the rap party, and everybody just kind of hung out. and had a Then few everybody drinks. got undressed. And then everybody got undressed. That's the end of the story. But yeah, we uh, we uh, actually crammed that entire shoot into one day, which I was very, very happy about. So, Now, did your Klingons, I, th I think I saw one of the other interviews, your, your Klingons did their own makeup. Were they, did they have their own costumes? Were they already you know, like people, you know, cosplayer Klingons? That's exactly right. And we did that. We did that strategically. John and I talked about the best way to, the smartest way, I guess, uh, to kind of do the Klingon stuff. And when you look at, you know, the world of fan films and indie films. I mean, it is a gold mine when you can hire costumers that look the part because they're entirely self-sufficient. In other words, you don't have to hire, um, you know, additional wardrobe or makeup folks to go do that for them. They, they just need a mirror because they do this stuff, you know, every other weekend anyway, and uh, they just need a mirror. So they show up early and they were completely self-sufficient. Uh, the Klingon, yeah, the, the three Klingons we had in the prologue, William J is the one with, uh, uh, he's the interrogator, the one with the, the speaking role. Uh, that is his costume. I actually helped build his costume many years ago. Uh, John talks about the Starfleet uniforms, but I want to give a plug out to those, you know, Klingon costumes. You can run easily up to three grand with those Klingon costumes. And uh, they're a heck of a lot of work. 
And William did all his own uh, makeup. We kind of learned from the tutelage of John Paladin, who was kind of one of the students of Mike Westmore back in the day. Paladin still does a lot of the makeup for uh, J.G. Hertzler and uh, Bob O'Reilly, Galron and Martok at the, on the con circuit and more. But we learned a lot from John over the years. Uh, William was a cosplayer. The other two Klingons are brothers, Matt and Dale Henry. Again, self-sufficient, had their own Klingon gear. They're local here in the D.C. area. Uh, any fan who goes to cons like Shore Leave or Farpoint or even Dragon Con down in Atlanta, they'll know the, the Henry brothers. They're infamous. Uh, and they came completely self-sufficient and they were perfect for what we needed. And uh, just a real quick story I'll give you, John. I don't think we, we talked about this any other time. The first few takes we did um, where the Klingons brought Carter into that cell where he's got the he's still got the hood over his head. You know, when we we yelled action and the guys were coming in and it was all a little soft for me. It was a little dainty and, you know, they weren't really roughing John up as much as I'd kind of seen in my mind. And it, it was all very quiet as well. And that's not the Matt and Dale Henry that I know, because when you run into Matt and Dale at a con and they're in full Klingon regalia, I mean, they're, uh, you better watch out because they're, they're the, full, they're the total package and, and they're loud. And I wasn't seeing Matt and Dale, when we would say action, I wasn't seeing the Matt and Dell I needed. So I finally kind of stopped and said, guys, like, I don't care if it's gibberish. I want you shouting some Klingon words. When you come in the door, don't worry about fans who are going to dig out the Klingon dictionary and see if you got the words right. Just give me some grunts and screams and give me some Klingon. I said, I need you to be Matt and Dale. And then they kind of looked at me and said, Oh, okay. And then the very next take, we yelled action. And I mean, they were bringing John in like he was a prisoner of war, smashing him <laughs> up against the door frames, screaming gibberish and Klingon. Yeah. And, you know, and it was it was perfect. That's what I needed. I just needed to light light those guys up a little bit. And and, and and to that, um, when we would retake, when we reset to do another take, we're waiting to, to be brought out. And they would ask me, you know, in their soft voice, are you okay? Can you breathe in that hood? Do you want me to lift it up for you? I mean, they were... And then as soon as he said action, they were, they were in full <laughs> playing on mode, loud, you know, throwing me, manhandling me. It was, it was, yeah. So quick. And, and, and also, um, yeah, as John Johnny mentioned, these guys are well known at the, um, especially in the Baltimore, the Shore Leave and um, Farpoint conventions. And it was, it was like five years ago or so when I approached them, when they were in their Klingon uniforms, I talked about working with them in Farragut Forward. And so it was nice to be able to see that realized um, in this film and having their involvement. I mean, they were, they were a delight. Oh, cool. All right. So, um, obviously you're right now, you're focused on making your $30,000 crowdfunder. Two possibilities. You reach your goal. You don't reach your goal. So I'm going to ask you first, you reach your goal. You have your $30,000 or more. The next thing is, you build your sets, you get your costumes ready. When is production going to happen on this? When do you think the film will be finished and released, assuming all goes well? Um, when, when can we see what we're paying for? Do you want me to? Well, once, once we are funded, the intent is while the sets are being um, built, we can already start filming the climax. Um, because it's not dependent on sets, or at least not those sets. Um, we also probably would be able to film some of the Klingon stuff first, and then the back end with the Starship sets. Uh, but I know we've Johnny and I have talked about leveraging all of 2022 for building out sets, wardrobe, and then filming. And then I think we have it targeted for March of next year release. Oh, that would be impressive. A little over a year, um, and then and then the question that nobody wants to you know ask, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, you don't make it. You're you're stuck at eight thousand or ten thousand or fifteen thousand. You don't make it to thirty. What happens? 
We don't have a corridor. <laughs> we we get we get out the green screen. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the, the, rest the, of the film the, takes place on the Klingon ship. <laughs> <laughs> we just punt on on the starship set, and we. Maybe maybe we, we deal with a shuttlecraft or, or something. I don't know. How many Jonathan Jonathan? How many of those sweaters do you have in your closet? Can we borrow those? For, uh, can we borrow those sweaters for wardrobe? <laughs> Looks like you're gonna need them. Um, yeah, I'll send you a few. You, you got to have you know triple extra large. You know, long, big, and tall. Uh, you know, I think you know for John it would be you know kind of like wearing a dress. Uh, <laughs> but um, but yeah, it, you know it, it's it, it's kind of it's a question a lot of fan filmmakers face if they can't, you know, cause every, everything, everything costs more than you think it's going to cost anyway. You know, that, that, that's sort of true in every Hollywood movie that, you know, there's, there are very few projects that ever come in like ridiculously under budget, you know, like, Oh wow. We have, you know, <laughs> we have 50,000, $50 million left. Like, no, that never happens. Um, but obviously if you, if you don't, reach it there's a lot of times where you just have to like okay what can we cut what can we cut so uh, you know there's 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 you know certain ways that you, know, you can proceed in, in situations like that you can have a second crowdfunder you know you can basically try to film the scenes that you can film and you know release maybe a part one uh, and then crowdfund your part two separately uh, or you can um, <clears throat> you can basically you know go and beg you know for money again and say okay well we didn't make it but we're going to try you know one more time and see if people will give you money a second time or you know you, you can start uh, you know hitting up uh, rich uncles and whatever and just you know praying that people will give you money to make a silly star trek fan film doesn't always work and uh you There's know a lot so of it's scenarios a, i think that we're trying to just focus on on being optimistic and achieving our goal by working it you know and and I think that people want to see a quality TOS movie era film. It, it's not nothing. I don't think to the extent of what we're trying to do is out there now. And I think the story that we have um, yes. and with John behind the camera, I think people will want to see it. So, I mean, I'm, I'm being optimistic and we'll be working every day to try to um, get donations and get people to help finance it. Yeah. Cause that's the other thing I was going to mention, which is, you know, crowdfunding is, is a full-time occupation uh, it is. for these 30 days or 60 days that they're doing it. It's painful. Uh, yeah. You know, and, and, I, and I've seen a lot of people launch a crowdfunder and just forget about it. Uh, you know, there's, there's this uh, crowdfunder I'm, I'm watching. Uh, it's a Kickstarter crowdfunder. They, I, th I think they need like $6,500 and they have like no, you know, the, the, the shortest video ever, which is just basically their credits. And it shows, you know, it's basically the original TOS credits and it just has their names in it. And then there's like a bunch of green screen outtakes. I don't know what they are, but, um, you know, there's the costumes aren't great. You really can't see what they're doing. They don't really tell you what they're doing. And it's got like, you know, two paragraphs of description. And, you know, I, I was sent this by Samuel Cocking saying, you know, worst crowdfunder ever. And uh, I was looking at like, I'd never heard about these guys. You know, they, they'd never reached out to me to say, you know, John can, you know, you help get some publicity out of fan film factor. I don't see them on, you know, any of the boards on any of the Facebook groups or whatever. And, you know, they're at $504 donated so far in what I think has been about 40 days. And it's been, I don't know, uh, I think like five or six donations and I just have it up there just kind of watching it. And, you know, it's like literally everything you shouldn't do. And, you know, I've been watching you guys so far and it's everything you should do. You release the teaser, you release the, you know, the prologue. So everybody's excited. They know what you can do, you know, and then you launch the crowdfunder. And, you know, from what I understand, you guys have a lot of stuff that you're planning on doing over the next couple of months, including obviously this interview. So, Obviously, you know, I'm going to donate, um, you know, and I, I'm going to tell people who are still watching at this point, donate, give these guys money. I always say that. <laughs> but, you know, this is going to be cool. This is going to be, a, you know, a, a movie era uh, fan film. So I, I think it's going to be, you know, definitely worth your shekels to donate to. So uh, the last question for you guys is, once again, going back to the happy path, you managed to build your sets. You film your half an hour long or however long it's going to be. You know, by the way, what is it, what is the full 
title going to be here? You want to mention that at all, or is that still under wraps? I think we're still we're still wrestling around with that one just a little bit. We actually, I think there was a working title, which I think we removed from the crowdfunding language yesterday, just because we didn't want to commit to that fully. Oh, yet. Yeah. So we'll, we'll keep that one close to the vest for now. All right. So, you know, the fan film that shall not be named. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so the fan film that will not be named. I mean, Farragut Forward. I mean, there you go. Farragut Forward. You can yeah. call Farragut Forward. Um, well, and, and that's the thing is like, it's fair for the new fan series. And I know that, you know, John and I have talked uh, off, offline a little bit about this, you know, can you do a fan series? You know, the guidelines say that you can't. And yet, you know, you've got Dreadnought Dominion that has a fan series and Avalon Universe that has a fan series. And obviously Vance Major has 150 different fan films with the same people. And, you know, Constar continues, and Constar completed and everything else. And, you know, so there's certainly a lot of folks that are saying, okay, well, if we can't have a fan series, then, you know, let's just do a fan series. I was going to, one of the things that John, Johnny and I have talked about is, is more than, we'd like to be able to do more than one, but do it in a way that creatively respects the fan film guidelines. Um, we like to, keeping the, the analogy of, of him being, Nick Meyer, me being Gene Roddenberry, if we're able to do what they did with um, Star Trek II, Harvey Bennett and uh, Nick Meyer, where they were able to create a nice trilogy, it'd be nice to be able to create a nice trilogy. And we have a creative way that kind of respects the guidelines, but circumvents the rules in the sense that we could do that. So the sets that we're building now will be amateurized and be able to be able to use to tell um, the other two films. So the cost for those films would be less um, than what we're asking for now. So ah, give now, so you don't have to give later. <laughs> How about that? I, I, mean, we, <laughs> I would, I would say that good tagline. You know, if, if, yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I try not to think about the negative of not being able to, to make it, but if we don't make it, I mean, I don't, I don't know if some of us would be emotionally bested to move forward with, we might be burnt out by the, the one. So, but the intent would be that we are successful and that we've got full force and we're working to, you know, do the big vision. There's, there's some stakeholders. There's some um, key players within the project that have a vested interest in seeing the other films. So hopefully they'll be actively involved in the crowdfunding and getting the word out. Yeah, I mean, the more people that you can show are involved in it, you know, the, you know, the good old cast members, you know, you know <laughs> bring, bring Mike and Holly out, you know, they're not going to want to do it, but bring them out anyway, just say, give us money. Uh, <laughs> you know, you do, because I mean, you do have a lot of fans out there. And, 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 you, and, and by the way, you also have your old, you should have your old mailing lists from the, the Kickstarters that you used to do, right? We do. Yeah. So, you know, about that, have those yeah. people on the virtual shoulders that they gave to you before they that's called a, a pre-sold donor. Um, Let me throw something but, out there too. We, we talked a lot about, it. we talked a lot about, you know, the sets and the look of this thing and the, you know, the costumes and those are kind of the tangible visible things that everybody can look at and touch. Um, I guess kind of what John and Paul and me have that no one else really has yet or knows is it's a damn good story. And, you know, no one else really knows that yet. So the folks that were asking to, contribute money you know they're they're obviously trusting that it's a good story whereas we know it's a good story and i've you know i made a pretty bold statement the other day that i don't regret but i've seen the script obviously for you know the work that we have in front of us for the rest of this year and if we manage to pull it off i absolutely think it'll be one of the best star trek fan films ever made i agree based on the story well, forget forget the monster maroon and the the bridges it's all just background yeah no i i, I wholeheartedly agree and it's in a good fact story. one when Johnny was telling me we spent all day or all morning going through all the refinements that he was laying out. I was just, I was thinking to myself, it is that good that for the cast, I'd like them to all sign an NDA just because I don't want it leaked out. I mean, I thought we did a pretty good job with keep for this three minute film. I mean, it wasn't easy having Paul sit still. It wasn't easy not leaking photos, but for this, because it is such a great story, I think we have to protect it. And so we plan to roll out having the cast members sign an NDA to kind of protect it. So for the fans and everyone out there, um, so they can see it. 
without I'm, no. I'm, I'm all for that, but I, I, I do think the tagline of give to the best fan film ever uh, might be better than give now so you don't have to give later. Uh, <laughs> But you know, you can work out uh, that. I actually, I really, I really think you need to uh, to use uh, the the image that I created of of the most interesting captain in Starfleet. That that's what I really think you need to. <laughs> oh yeah, I remember that. That's yeah. right. <laughs> I took a look at John, and uh, I just you know, and you had that tan. I mean, you were just you were golden at that point in that <laughs> photo, and I was just like, yeah, that is the most interesting captain in Starfleet. So you know, I made that fun little graphic for you. <laughs> I don't even think, correct me if I'm wrong, John, I don't even think we released any publicity images of Bednar as Tackett. I think yeah, we, we didn't. We didn't. Um, so we even just, that. we held on to that and we kept everything. Yeah. I mean, it was just me and then um, William J as Koroff. Yeah. Um, we shared a lot of pictures of, of, of that, but that was, that was it. I felt like if we showed Bednar as Tackett, I mean, it's only a three minute piece. You don't want to show off your entire thing. <laughs> no, I was, I was blown away by that. Cause I was just like, you know, John will tell you, you know, I could read him for homecoming. It's like, you know, will, will Mike be returning for fair good forward? And he just, he wouldn't tell me. It's like, uh, I'm not going to comment on any of the cast members uh, right now. So uh, like, yeah, I, I tried, I tried to pry it out of them, but, uh, but yeah, you put that in the A out there. Cause I might try again. Uh, as I <laughs> yeah. the cast members. Um, oh, one last question because you were talking. About... <laughs> um, What's that? I was going to say uh, one last question because uh, you were talking about your 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 Klingon uh, protagonist, and uh, I remember from your other interview you said that his name had a, a rather unique and homage uh, origin. So, would you like to explain? Sure, if you remember, um, in in TOS we had the the great Klingon warriors Kor and Koloth. Um, and, and trying to think of a name, and there was Kang, of course, too. But I was just thinking of, of, of something, and just I merged Kor with Koloff and made Kora, and um, that's that's how that came about. <laughs> it's a, no, it's a, it's a cool name, and he's a cool Klingon. I mean, he's a pretty boy Klingon, you know. He's a he's a, he's a what? Klingon. I, he's a pretty boy Klingon. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. He definitely. I mean, he. You don't know it's William. Um, he. And he, yeah, he's. A, I think we're going to see a lot of Korok. Not yeah, only he's, in this he's answer, intriguing. But down the road. Yeah. Oh, I hope I, I hope so. But I was like noticing the teeth. You know, they're just like they're like Invisalign. You know, putting on Invisalign teeth. They just look so good. <laughs> you know. Uh, but uh, but everything. You know, it, it, it all looks so amazing. You know, and and, and Johnny, your 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 eye for for lighting and you know, I mean, that looked like the Klingon bird, the inside of the Klingon bird of prey that we would see in Star Trek three, you know, in Star Trek four, that, that, you know, that, that dark look and, you know, guys, just so you know, you folks who are watching, it's not easy to film stuff. That's dark. Cameras have to be sort of manipulated in order to make sure that stuff that's dark doesn't look all fuzzy and blurry and crappy. So John, Johnny knows what he's doing there. And, um, did you, and did you, did you guys have a fog machine? Just uh, as I, as any- I mentioned, as I mentioned recently, any machine is a fog machine if you use it wrong enough. <laughs> <laughs> your your blender can become a smoke machine if you use it wrong. Oh yeah, <laughs> we had, we had some we had some smoke rolling through there, and it, it tended to, it was such a small room anyway. So once you fired off some uh, some smoke or haze in that room, it had a tendency to stick around for a long time. So we kind of yeah. had to you got to wave it around and you know kind of manipulate it to get it where you want it to be but yeah we had some smoke rolling through there for sure yeah it's it's, it's also hard to, to film with smoke because if you if you have too much of it you know, puff too much you know, suddenly you're you know you're underwater you're in the lung and fog and mm-hmm. uh you know not enough of it you don't even see it so you know i mean you, you just you know you hit it you know just, i i can't praise you enough uh <laughs> But I want to see more of this stuff. So, uh, you know, once again, uh, I'm going to to say it again for the 14th time. Give these people your money. Uh, <laughs> you know, they, they will use it wisely. You will get a movie era fan film out of it. Uh, is there anything else you guys would like to say to your many, many, many fans as we wrap this up? Um, from this end, thank you guys for all the support for all the years of watching us and backing us and appreciating the work that we that we've done it makes it worthwhile and um i hope that this one i believe it will be the best effort um yet and um i think you'll enjoy it so please 
help and support us. Give to the best fan film ever. Yes. All right. And Johnny K, too cool for the last name there. Too cool for the last name. Actually, I just want to thank John, because if you put yourself in John's shoes, uh, I'm kind of the new kid on the block. You know, he's been doing the Star Trek fan film thing. Both of you guys have for many, many, many years. You know, I have not. I am kind of the the outsider poking my head into this. Uh, hence the the Nick Meyer, Gene Roddenberry joke between us. Um, but just put yourself in John's shoes. He's kind of handed the keys to his baby over to another person uh, to kind of turn the lights off and, you know, bring out the pain sticks. And it's a, a different vibe. And we talked about that a lot last year about, you know, just kind of my stylistic taste and, you know, my, it's not, it's not really your, it's not your daddy's Farragut. I think John had mentioned a couple of times <laughs> last year, uh, just because it's not sixties TOS, you know, we're going to a different place. We're going to a moodier, a moodier spot and a darker tonality and just kind of put yourself in John's shoes. He handed me the keys and basically said, here's, here's the keys to the car. Try not to wreck it. So I don't know how much I've really thanked John, but there's a lot of trust uh, that goes on there. And, you know, I just wanted to thank John for putting his trust in, in me. And I think the, the, you know, the end product, I'm very happy with the prologue. Um, and I, you know, the story that I've got on the script over here beside me, uh, if we can pull that off the way that, you know, that vision plays out in our heads, it's going to be fantastic. So I just wanted to, you know, take the opportunity to kind of thank John for putting his trust in me and, and not being too precious with his baby because it might, it might've worked out in a different way. <laughs> All righty. Well, I want to thank all the people here named John or Johnny or Jonathan for that matter. It's the John Day. Uh, <laughs> but I want to thank, thank you uh, to Top Johns for um, your time today. I want to wish you all the luck getting getting to that $30,000 goal and then getting us this amazing Farragut forward, whatever the subtitle is of that. So uh, anyway, uh, thank you guys again and the best of luck to you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Appreciate it.